questioning young Thank people. Thank you, Senator Rennick. The time for two minute statements has expired. We're now going to move to question time. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. Here, here. United Workers Union Secretary Tim Kennedy said that workplace laws should most definitely be amended to allow workers to hit major companies with strikes at the same time. Minister, will you guarantee that the Albanese Labor government will not allow this to occur? Yeah. Um, Minister. Minister what? Thank you, President, and uh, thank you, Senator McGrath, for the question. What is it about the opposition that all they want to do is talk about conflict? What is it about them? They can't. The, the, the simple concept. Uh, Minister, resume your seat. We'll just wait for quiet so we can all hear the minister's response. Senator McKenzie, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. As I say, I mean, what is it about these people? They've been in government for nine years delivered a wages and bargaining system that is completely broken, had wage, low wages as a design feature of their economic policy. Um, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. Is it with this minister that he can, refuses to answer the most basic uh, Senator, of questions? Sorry, Senator McKenzie. Order. Order. May I remind senators, if you are seeking to make a point of order, you stand and you indicate to the Senate that you are making a point of order, and that is not a point of order. Please continue, Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. It, it really is a shame that after an election, after a Jobs and Skills Summit, which saw the country brought together by a new government, that the only group that doesn't want to accept that people want to cooperate is the opposition. I mean, we know what it's like to be in opposition. We were there for a few years. The approach we took was that you pick your fights. You actually look for constructive opportunities when you can. You pick your fights when you really have to. But this opposition, all they seem to do is whatever the idea, they're against it. They'd be against Order. the sun rising in the, in the east. They'd be against the sun setting in the west because they want to oppose everything that happens. Now, the opposition want to continue fighting, just like they did for nine years. They want to continue delivering lower productivity, lower wages through a conflict-driven IR system. But it's not just an IR system that they want to maintain the conflict. I was very interested uh, to see— Senator McGrath, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator what? Sorry. Uh, Senator McGrath. Point of order, uh, mm -hmm. President, on, on relevance. The, the question was, was very tightly uh, worded. And the, the minister has, has come nowhere near answering the question, in fact has gone anywhere near but answering the question. I would ask you to get the minister to come back and answer the question, please. Uh, thank you, Senator McGrath. I would remind senators that uh, question time should be conducted in relative quiet. It has been very hard for me to hear Senator Watt, despite Senator Watt being able to project his voice. Um, but I'll remind Senator Watt of the question, and uh, you have 37 seconds left um, to answer the question. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, President. Uh, the government have made very clear that we will be consulting employers, unions and a range of other people as to how uh, this agreement will be implemented and deal with all of those issues. But I, again, I was very concerned to see some reports this morning in The Australian uh, that in response to Cosboa's comments about reaching an agreement on these matters, coalition backbenchers were, quote, out for blood on the issue. Now, we've heard a lot about thuggery and intimidation from the other side when it comes to industrial relations. Well, who are the thugs now? Who's doing the intimidating now? In fact, some coalition MPs argued that Cosboa had betrayed small business owners, likening Thank it to you, a Minister, snake. Your time That's has the expired. kind of uh, Senator McGrath, first supplementary. Minister, can you guarantee that there will be no productivity losses caused by industry-wide bargaining and strike action? Uh, Minister. Thank, thank you, President. Senator McGrath, I don't know who's feeding you your questions, but you really should have a read of them before you ask them. I mean, you want to talk about lower productivity in this country. Who was responsible for lower productivity over the last nine years? You! It was the opposition that was responsible for that through a conflict-driven uh, IR system. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Payne, I would ask the Senate to listen quietly so that we can all hear the response from the minister. Order. Uh, minister. 
Thank you, President. It's, it's actually good to know Senator Payne's still here. I hadn't heard much from her since the election, so it's good to, good to hear from her. The, um, but we want to talk um, about lower productivity. Minister, oh, you're back. Please. You're back. You're back. Order. Minister. No, I'm, I'm welcoming more contributions from Senator Payne. That's what I'm doing. Now, seriously, lower productivity. You want to talk about a, an IR system that delivers lower productivity? Have a look in the mirror. You had nine years of delivering lower productivity through an IR system that was all about conflict and not about agreement. That's what we're trying to fix. We're trying to fix an IR system that is riven by conflict, and you want to drag us back to a system with lower productivity and lower wages. That's why the Australian people voted against you, because they want Thank more you, agreement Minister, and less your conflict. Time has expired. Senator McGrath, second supplementary. Given rising interest rates, rising inflation and businesses battling the increased costs of doing business, why is the Albanese government prioritising policies that will encourage economy-wide strike action? Uh, Minister. The, the Senator McGrath is correct. We do see cost of living pressures in this country at the moment, and that's why we have a range of policies in place to deal with it, such as delivering wage rises. That's the best way to deliver cost of living relief, is to get people's wages Minister, up. Minister, please resume your seat. Can we please have quiet when the minister is answering? Senator Mackenzie, I've just pulled this, the Senate up and Senator Wong for the constant interjections. I would appreciate it when the minister is answering the question to do your questions to give him the courtesy of listening to the answer. Please continue, uh, Minister. Thank you, President. Uh, as I say, we recognise there are cost of living pressures in, in this country, and that's why we're acting on it. We're acting on it in terms of cheaper childcare. We're acting on it in cheaper medicines. Uh, we're putting downward pressure on energy prices. That is part of our commitment, as we have said. And more importantly, and more importantly, we are lifting wages at the same time. Which government supported a minimum wage rise? The Albanese Labor government. Who opposed it? The opposition. Which government supported a wage rise for aged care workers? The Albanese Labor government. Who opposed it? The opposition. That is how we're going to fix cost of living pressures, Order. not by dragging our IR system back to the past and then accusing people who have to, the right to stand up for it for um, being out for Minister, blood. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator McGrath, these were your questions, and uh, don't answer back. Thank you. I'm asking you to respect the question that you asked and the answer that's being given. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Uh, have you finished, Minister? Um, Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, President. And my question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister outline how the recent Jobs and Skills Summit, which I was privileged to attend on Thursday morning, uh, placed women front and centre to ensure gender equality is a core economic priority? Minister. Thank you, President. I thank um, Senator O'Neill for the question and acknowledge her um, advocacy in relation to women's policy over the years um, and acknowledge that today. The Albanese Labor government's Jobs and Skills Summit brought together Australians, including unions, employers, civil society and governments, to find common ground on some of our big economic challenges and to, to drive a consensus towards uh, the solutions. And women's economic equality was a core focus of the summit. I've been really pleased by the response to date uh, at, at the role of women at the summit. They were more than 50 per cent of the participants. Uh, they led the panels. They led the debate. There were some amazing uh, speakers uh, that attended the summit, um, full of talent and, and just amazing to witness uh, their contributions and the fact that they were centre stage and a key focus of it. Gender equality and women's economic participation were points of discussion across all of the sessions at the Jobs and Skills <laughs> Summit. Uh, day, the two-day summit's first session was focused specifically on this topic, where participants um, in, the, in the policy space around uh, equal opportunity and pay uh, were discussed, but so were issues like the care economy, boosting work and training opportunities for women and examining how we can make all workplaces safer for women and practical measures to reduce the gender pay gap were all discussed at the summit. We've, uh, I think one of the key outcomes of the summit, apart from the fact that the women and the talented women at the summit were so amazing, was that um, there was agreement across all participants that women's 
economic equality should be seen as a key economic priority, something that I know many senators, like Senator McAllister and Senator Waters, have been arguing for some time. Thank you, Minister. Senator O'Neill, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, can the minister highlight the measures for women that have been announced out of the Jobs and Skills Summit? Minister. Thank you very much, President. I thank Senator O'Neill for the supplementary. The government, uh, following the summit, there were a number of areas where we did reach agreement. Uh, one of them was around modernising Australia's workplace relations laws to make sure that uh, bargaining is accessible for all workers and businesses, including those really uh, feminised industries where we have seen um, really low wages growth and the failure of the bargaining system to work for women. Um, improving access to jobs and training pathways for women, First Nations people, regional Australians and culturally linguistically diverse people, including equity targets for training places, a thousand digital apprenticeships in the Australian public service and other measures to reduce barriers to employment. We're also making sure that the APS is leading by example by re reporting to WGIA and to set targets on improving gender equity in the public service. And there were a range of other agreements around reporting data through to WGIA. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator O'Neill, second supplementary. Uh, thank you for <laughs> that report on the practical action arising. C can the minister outline how this builds? on existing commitments made by the Albanese Labor government to advance the issues facing Australian women and restore national leadership on gender equality. Minister. Um, thank you, President. I thank Senator O'Neill for a question. And she's right. I mean, for too long, women's policy was in the wilderness uh, under the previous government. It's front and centre uh, in this government. That's the serious, that's the big change. Everything we discuss, every policy developed, um, every consideration, we will have an analysis of what that means for women. How does that impact women? Is it good? Is it bad? How do we change it to make sure it, it um, deals with some of the issues that comes out of that research? And I would note, it was one of, it's no surprise that um, Mr Morrison didn't uh, take on the Ministry for Women portfolio <laughs> when he was taking uh, Senator Birmingham's portfolio. Poor old Senator Birmingham, he shared his finance ministry for the entire time he was finance minister with the prime minister, unlike Tony Abbott, who did take the women's ministry. But we are putting women's uh, policy front and centre, and I look forward to working with all interested senators on, on, um, on doing just that. Thank you, Minister. Senator Dean Smith. Very much, Madam President. My question is to the minister representing the assistant treasurer and minister for financial services, Senator Gallagher. Does the minister know of any Treasury portfolio precedent for removing transparency on payments through aggregation, as has been delivered for the superannuation industry and trade unions in regulations released last Friday? Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. And I would have to take on notice um, the precedent um, question that you asked, because I do want to make sure that all of my answers here are uh, are um, accurate, and I'm sorry, but I don't have all of that dating back to 1901, <laughs> where you know your question leads me to. So I would want to have a look at that. I would also say that um, that uh, the regulations uh, t uh, tabled by the minister, of the assistant treasurer um, and minister for financial services. I think had responded to some of the concerns that had been raised around transparency in this place um, and uh, amended or from the draft regulations to ensure that, um, that those questions around transparency could be dealt with. So I'm sure the Senate will have more to say on this as it, it debates these regulations, uh, but I think he, the Assistant Treasurer had responded to some of the concerns. and that. Data will be provided, but as as you know, and I, I think I've heard it from you guys plenty of times over the years, to making sure we uh, reporting is transparent, but it's also efficient and effective uh, is equally important. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Smith, mm. first supplementary. Madam President, this is not my first supplementary, but just to query, does this, does this mean that the information Senator will be provided Smith, at the end of question doing? time? Uh, Senator Smith, you will recall I reminded the Senate at the beginning of question time, if you are seeking a point of order, say it. I've invited you to make your first supplementary. My query is whether or uh, not Senator, Senator Smith, Gallagher will Senator Smith, make... resume your seat. Either ask your 
first supplementary or I'll have no alternative other than to move on. First then my first supplementary question is, can the minister confirm that payments from super funds to unions could rise from, from $12.9 million in 2021-22 to $35 million in 2030? Can the minister further confirm that the details of these payments will now be hidden from super fund members? Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, I don't thank you, and I thank um, Senator Smith for the, the supplementary. I'm not sure where those numbers are coming from, so I would want to check on those uh, before uh, going to the specifics. But look, um, we know you're opposed to super. We know you can't stand industry funds. We know you don't like unions. You don't like unions. You don't like industry funds. You don't like super. You can't bear it. The regulations will allow transparent reporting of information streamlining some of the requirements. They will still be required to do a whole range of reporting. I know you're obsessed with the fact that you think that industry super funds make political donations, which is where this is going. They've been asked about that. They say they don't. We've asked the independent regulator, APRA, who has been poring over this issue, and they haven't found anything. So, Let's debate it. I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to debate these when the regs come before the Senate. Thank you, Minister. Senator Smith, second supplementary. Thank you very much, Madam President. The Assistant Treasurer and Minister for Financial Services justified the recently updated regulations on superannuation annual members' meeting notices by claiming that the previous disclosure rules were too onerous on funds. What is the estimated cost saving the industry may be able to benefit from as a result of these new measures? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister. Thank you, Madam President. And I will take that part of the question on notice as well, and I'll come back to the chamber uh, if I can find, provide further information. But I would say that under the reg draft regulations that no doubt this Senate will debate, Funds will still be required to provide written notice to members, which details fund performance, their outcomes for the period, the total payments they make to industrial bodies, marketing and advocacy. Um, and um, uh, if I can provide further information around this, notwithstanding the fact that we acknowledge the opposition are opposed to superannuation, really, if you were able to say it, you would. Senator Rennick just said it was evil. You just said it was evil. We know what you're on about. You're uh, obsessed with Minister, industry funds. Minister, you're obsessed with Minister super. Gallagher, you're obsessed Minister, with working people Minister, actually having a decent Minister. retirement. Um, Senator Scar and Senator McGrath, I believe you were directing those comments directly at the minister, and I'd ask them to be withdrawn without repeating the offence. I withdraw. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, minister, have you finished? Uh, Senator Cox. Two, two weeks ago, the government opened up 47,000 square kilometres of Australia's oceans for gas and oil exploration. The science is overwhelmingly Sorry, clear. Sorry, Senator Cox, I don't want to interrupt you, but the question is directed oh, to the which question minister? Is to minister Farrell. Thank you. Please continue. <laughs> yeah, can't help that one. Sorry, can't Order. help that one. <laughs> um, to Minister Farrell, representing the Minister for Resources. Um, in order for us to avoid this climate disaster, we simply can't open up any new fossil fuel uh, or gas fields. What formula did the Minister for Resources apply in making the decision to ensure that the recent announcement didn't contravene the government's own 43 per cent emissions reduction target and Australia's commitments under the Paris Agreement? Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Madam President, uh, and thank uh, the Senator for the um, uh, the question. And uh, I'd start by uh, prefacing my comments uh, that um, Senator King has uh, been doing a uh, sorry, Minister King has been doing a terrific job uh, in this space since uh, she uh, she came uh, into the uh, into the portfolio. Um, very fine, very fine job. Uh, the Albanese, if you if you let me, with with respect, uh, Senator, if you let me uh, finish uh, my uh, my answer. Um, the order, as, as distinct from the now opposition, the uh, Albanese government went to the last election 
uh, with a commitment that uh, uh, we would uh, introduce. Uh, um, um, 40... Minister, please resume your seat. Sorry, uh, Senator Cox. Question was quite direct. What formula did the minister apply in her decision making um, in this recent amount, announcement about ocean? Acreage? And you're raising a point of order. Yes. On relevance. Yes. Yeah. Um, Senator Cox, I'll just draw your. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Minister, I'll just draw your um, attention back to the question um, put by Senator Cox. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the. Um, no, that'll be later, <coughs> Senator. Um, the, uh, the Albanese government went to the last election with a commitment to uh, uh, reduce um, emissions by 43 per cent by 2030, Order. and that's, that's what we're going to do. That's, that's the commitment we made to the Australian people. Uh, that's the commitment we will deliver on. And in a very short space of time, you're going to get a chance to vote on that very commitment. Now, in the meantime, in the meantime, uh, in the meantime, um, we need to transition from the current position that uh, we find ourselves in to that 43% reduction. Uh, and the way in which we're going to do that. Um, Thank you, Minister. The oh. time has expired. Senator Cox, first supplementary. Considering. Order. <laughs> Senator Cox. Considering we didn't get an answer to that one, uh, can the minister provide a time frame in which the government will sign and implement the Global Methane Pledge for a transition out of fossil fuels into a cleaner, greener energy future? Minister Farrell. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Madam uh, President, and uh, thank the Senator for her, uh, her, her question. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Minister, Senator, uh, Minister King, uh, has uh, of course been dealing uh, with, uh, with all of these uh, issues. Um, they are uh, important issues, they're, they're uh, difficult issues. Um, <coughs> they are issues. Well, we, we took we took a series of commitments. We took a series. We took. We took. Order. We, Order. Senator Wong. It's the wrong Minister, call please continue. I take Thank you, uh, uh, Madam President. We took a series of commitments to the last election, and we were elected as the government of this uh, of this country. Uh, one of those commitments was the uh, 43 per cent uh, emission reduction target by uh, uh, 2030 and the zero emission uh, target Thank by— Thank you, Minister. Uh, Your time has expired. <laughs> Senator Cox, second supplementary. Let's try a different tack, shall we? <clears throat> I don't know. Deb, are you asking the question? <laughs> Order. When will— Minister Tavara, when will this government listen to the voices of First Nations people who have not provided free prior informed consent to the destruction of their cultural heritage and continue to see disrespect for their self-governance and determination of economic development relating to resources projects on their country? Go on. Uh, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, the uh, senator for her, uh, her question. Um, there is no government in this uh, country's history that's got a greater commitment uh, to dealing with the uh, issue of Indigenous uh, disadvantage than the Albanese uh, Labor government. Uh, we, we, intend, we intend to deliver on all of the promises that we made to Indigenous, uh, Indigenous Australians in the lead-up to the last election, and that, of course, Includes a referendum on the uh, on the voice for, um, the, for Senator, the first. Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Thorpe. Point of order, President. Mm -hmm. Relevance. The question was on free, prior, and informed consent. Yep. We don't want to hear about uh, them flag you, waving for black uh, We want to know how they got Senator consent. Senator Thorpe, resume your seat. And I do remind you and other senators when you put a point of order, it is about the question. It is short and sharp, and it does not include any additional comments such as those that you made. The minister is being relevant. Please continue, Minister Farrell. Thank, thank you, uh, um, Madam uh, President. Um, this, 
this uh, government uh, has made a commitment to Indigenous Australians. Uh, that commitment uh, includes, includes, amongst other things, uh, a referendum uh, on the voice, giving Indigenous Australians a voice uh, in, the, uh, in, this, uh, in this parliament. Uh, that is what we Thank intend— Thank you, Minister. The time has expired. As Senator Grogan. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister of Climate Change and Energy, Senator Wong. Uh, can the minister outline to the Senate the importance of ending the climate wars and legislating a target on climate change? Minister. Thank you, uh, President, and thank you to Senator Grogan and for your advocacy as well on climate and other progressive issues over many years. And those on this side of the chamber understand that action on climate change isn't just good for the future of the country. It isn't just necessary uh, because of the situation we see around the globe. It's also good for our economy. It's good for Australian jobs. That's what it's good for. I know this is difficult for those opposite to understand. After nine years of uh, the climate wars being a centrepiece of your political project, it is hard for you to understand that there is actually a way forward that is about jobs and about uh, dealing with, the, with, with climate. Um, the Senator, legislation— Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Rustin. Ma Madam President, I was just seeking some advice from you as to whether this question was in order. Is this order. a point of order? No, I'm actually seeking some advice from you uh, in relation to whether this uh, question is in order given the matter that is currently before debate in this chamber in government business. Oh, thank you, Senator Rustin. I'll <coughs> seek some advice. Um, Senator Rustin, as long as anyone answering this question uh, does not go to the specifics of the bill before the Senate, then it is um, perfectly fine to talk in generalities. Order! Order! In the way the ministers are doing. Uh, Minister Wong. Thank you. And I, I anticipated this might happen, actually, because— and, and uh, can I tell you why? Because we know those on the other side will do anything not to talk about climate change. You will do anything not to talk about climate action. You will do anything not to debate the bill. And you will do anything to ignore that the Australian people Order. clearly voted for action on Order. climate. And you can't bear it, can you? You can't bear it. You can't bear it that the climate war that you thought would continue to yield a political dividend might actually end. Might actually end. You can't bear it. Now, I would just Order. make the point, Madam President, President, that President Reid in 1999 made this point that questions may not be asked on the detail of the bill or debate, but otherwise the topic is not barred from questioning. But I know that it's a hard thing. Order. If you're a member of the coalition, you just don't want to talk about climate because Senator Payne doesn't agree with Senator Canavan and Senator Mackenzie doesn't agree with Senator Rustin. And they are utterly divided on this. They are utterly divided on this and, and the voters Wong, know it. The time and the has voters expired. Order. I'm going to wait for I'm going to wait for quiet. And I would ask once again, it is order. Senator Mackenzie. <laughs> uh, Senator Grogan, first supplementary. Excellent response, Minister. Thank you so much. Um, can the minister outline the threats to certainty that underpin the investment needed to address climate change? Minister. I thank the senator for a question. And, you know, it's really interesting, isn't it, that the party that believes they're the party of business, yeah, right. the party that believes they're the party of investment, well, they're actually more like the old Soviet Union. They're more like the old Soviet Union, standing in the way of progress, standing in the way of the market. And you know, uh, those opposite have those opposite have presided presided over nine years, nine years. Of, of division and delay and dysfunction when it comes to climate. And you know, if you talk to the Business Council of Australia, if you talk to the National Farmers Federation, if you talk to Aki, 
All of them, all of them are welcoming a government that is actually prepared to give the market certainty, something you could never deliver when in government because of your deep divisions on this issue. The climate wars can end. We will, on this side, see that as a step Thank forward. You, Minister, I know it's deeply distressing expired. for the— Senator Grogan, second supplementary. Um, as you've pointed out, um, the Australians made a very clear choice at the election uh, that they wanted action on climate change following a wasted decade under the Liberals and the Nationals. Um, how does the Albanese Labor government climate policies deliver on action and put an end to the coalition's climate wars? Uh, before I call the minister, I'm going to ask for quiet when the minister responds. Minister. Well, um, President, uh, Australians did send the parliament a clear message. Uh, they voted for action on climate change. Yep. Uh, Australians in Wentworth, Australians in North Sydney, yep. Australians in Warringah, in McKellar, in Goldstein, in Higgins, in Boothby, in Curtin and Kooyong made their interests very clear. Uh, it's very clear. And I know those opposite. Those opposite really don't like to hear just how out of Minister, step with the Australian Minister, people they Minister are. Wong. Listen to them. This is the most you know, animated Wong. you've been since Senator the election. Wong. I'm waiting for quiet. Interjections are incredibly disorderly and people on my left are yelling. Minister, please continue. Yeah, they yell, President, because they really have nothing to say on this. That's why they yell. They've, they've got nothing to say. You've lo I'll take the interjection from Senator Watt. You've, they've lost their reason for being, That's right. which is a decade of the climate wars preventing progress. And now what are you going to do? What are you going to do when the bill comes before the chamber? The question for the Liberal Party and the, Co the National Thank you, Party, Minister, will you learn from your mistakes? Expired. That's Minister, the question for the Minister, coalition. Resume your seat. Senator D. Pocock. Thank you, President. Um, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Senator Wong. Has the Clean Energy Regulator raised any concerns with the government about the integrity of or design of two recent ACU methods, the plantation forestry or landfill gas methods? Minister. Uh, thank you um, to the Yes, I, I was getting some advice from Minister Bowen about the direct question. Isn't it? It's a dreadful thing to actually want to advise Order. the parliament, isn't it? Order. Such a dreadful thing. Order. I know that seems like an odd thing. It's You'd actually want to try and advise the parliament. Um, uh, Senator, thank you for the question and thank you for your interest in this issue. I, I know that there have been uh, a number of public concerns raised uh, about uh, the probity uh, and the veracity of uh, the, the units. Can I advise from Minister Bowen's office that the Clean Energy Regulator have not, has not raised any concerns. Uh, however, concerns have obviously been raised externally by others, uh, including, uh, I think, the senator and others who have been uh, in the media. Uh, I'm advised that these are being dealt with by the, the Chubb Review, uh, which I'm happy to give further information on when I can find that piece of paper. <laughs> So, Minister Bowen has commissioned uh, a review by uh, Professor Chubb, who, as you would know, is the former chief scientist, along with an expert panel. Uh, as prom this was promised before the election. The Minister Bowen, in opposition, uh, indicated that we would, uh, if we win go one government, commission an independent review to ensure the integrity carbon credits and their consistency with our, our agricultural biodiversity and other goals. Uh, Professor Ian Chubb has been ap appointed and is supported by three other experts in the fields of governance, science and carbon markets. The review will examine scheme governance and the integrity of key carbon crediting methods, including whether transparency could be improved. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, Senator Wong. I find it strange that the, the regulator hasn't raised any concerns when I've received a letter that acknowledges the need to reform the landfill gas methods from companies that represent over 80 per cent of the accus generated under this method. Given the regulator hasn't raised concerns, despite industry having concerns, are you worried that there's an inherent conflict of interest between the regulator both 
creating methods and then actually regulating them. Thank you, Senator. Minister. Well, I, I, well, uh, I, I thank the senator for the supplementary question, and I, I can say to him, uh, as someone who does uh, believe, uh, unlike some in this place, in the benefits of utilising the market for good rather than for bad, uh, that uh, we need, we need, we need, uh, <laughs> uh, we do need integrity uh, in the system of uh, carbon credits to to ensure uh, that there is additionality. We're actually reducing Australia's emissions and using an incentive to do so. Uh, I have seen some of the reporting, including, as the senator says, uh, from uh, firms uh, engaging in the market. Uh, I understand the concerns he's raising. Can I say to him, uh, this is some, these are some of the reasons why Minister Bowen has taken the view uh, that an independent review uh, is appropriate and that is underway. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Pocock, second supplementary. President, and thank you, Senator Wong. As you pointed out, given the need for transparency and accountability and ultimately integrity in our carbon markets, will the government commit to including a review of the regulator as a function of the Chubb review? Minister. Uh, look, uh, I, I think, uh, obviously, uh, I'll raise the issue you raise or, uh, with Minister Bowen, but I would make the point, if the, if the review is looking at scheme governance and integrity of carbon crediting methods, then, then obviously what we want is uh, all aspects of scheme governance to be appropriate. Um, uh, as I said, uh, you know, the, these are matters which have been discussed publicly. Where we understand the need for uh, integrity uh, in the market, uh, particularly uh, if, as we hope, the legislation which uh, the opposition don't want me to talk about passes this chamber, uh, then obviously there is a framework which would, would incentivise that. Uh, but uh, I think that the terms of the review, as, as I understand them from the advice I've received, do extend to scheme governance, and that's appropriate. Thank you. Uh, Senator Patterson. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. In July this year, the Reserve Bank Governor issued a warning to the new government, and I quote, an important consideration is how inflation expectations and the general inflation psychology in the community evolve. If inflation expectations shift up and businesses and workers come to expect higher rates of inflation on an ongoing basis, it will be harder to return inflation to target. It is in our collective interest that this does not happen, end quote. Does the minister agree with the Governor of the RBA? Thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. And yes, I do agree with the Governor um, on those comments, but I also would draw Senator Patterson's attention uh, to the comments that the Governor has been making for some time about wages growth essentially being a handbrake on the economy and, and advocating for sustainable and sensible wages growth, which we haven't seen now for a decade. Uh, and that is a problem in the economy. So, yes, uh, the governor is right to to raise the concerns around having wages rise exponentially, you know, <laughs> and out of control. But that is not what we're seeing in this country. We're not seeing inflation and the problems with inflation are not being driven by wages because wages haven't been moving anywhere mm. because they were a deliberate design feature of those opposite to keep them suppressed and, at best, stagnant. So we have to find the balance. We need sustainable, sensible wages growth for working people. Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. President, point of order on, uh, on direct relevance. The, uh, the quote from the RBA governor that Senator Patterson read order. had no reference to wages growth, which has been the dominant feature of everything the minister has been going on about for close to a minute now in, uh, in her time, uh, that, uh, that uh, the question and the quote relate specifically to broader inflationary impacts and expectations across the economy. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. I, like you, have been listening closely to the minister and I believe that she is being directly relevant to the question and I invite her to continue. Uh, thank you, Madam Pre uh, President. Sorry, drop the madam. Um, I, I believed I answered the question. Sorry, I, I, I'm happy to deal with it in the supplementary, but I think I have been directly relevant, and I think that goes to some of the challenges facing the economy at the moment, which the 
the RBA uh, bank is dealing with on the monetary side and we are dealing with uh, on the fiscal side is getting that balance right, making sure that we're um, not adding to inflationary pressures, but also making sure that working people are getting a bit of a crack at it and getting some suitable compensation to deal with those increasing costs of living that they're experiencing from uh, um, in rising inflation. And I would say the announcement that been uh, made by the RBA today will add to some of those pressures on households and the challenges for the, the bank and for the government to work hand in hand to make sure we're doing what we can to ease those pressures on people. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Patterson, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the minister for her answer to my primary question and her agreement with the RBA governor that we should not add to inflation expectations. But only eight days after the governor issued this warning, the assistant treasurer said prices for goods could go up, quote, 10, 15 or 20 per cent, and went on to predict hyperinflation and strikes. He later predicted a very rocky 12 months for the Australian economy. Given the Assistant Treasurer's language and his position adds significantly to the market's inflationary expectations, has the Treasurer, the Minister for Finance, the Prime Minister counselled the Assistant Treasurer on the impact of his comments on inflation expectations? Thank you, Senator Patterson. Um, Minister Gallagher. Oh, well, I'm going to, I'm doing, I'm going to take a bit of a punt on the fact that, um, that um, Senator Patterson is quoting selectively and has crafted <laughs> that question himself. Um, the government's expectations for um, inflation are outlined in the Treasurer's statement that he made in July. Um, that is that we would see inflation peak at seven and three quarter per cent in uh, the December quarter. Uh, that is the government's position on inflation and I think it aligns with the RBAs. As Senator Patterson, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President, and I welcome the uh, Finance Minister clarifying the Assistant Treasurer doesn't speak for the government on inflation. Uh, today, the Reserve Bank has raised interest rates uh, by 50 basis points, again the fourth rate rise now under this government. The RBA is having to lift interest rates to address skyrocketing inflation. Why is the Treasurer and his colleagues continuing to ignore the RBA governor's warning, the Assistant Treasurer, and predicting hyperinflation and economic tumult? Thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Well, honestly, the nerve of these uh, questions, it really is staggering. We inherited an economy with rising inflation and rising interest rates. Just let's not forget this. As a result of nine years of you guys with wasted opportunities and wrong or failed priorities. 22 Order. energy policies, a gas and energy crisis that we also inherited, a skills crisis that we also inherited, terminating measures that just drop off into the ether, a budget in a mess we also inherited. We are dealing with the realities of what happens when you have a Prime Minister with 10 portfolios or more because he didn't trust any of you. Um, he didn't trust any of you. Minister. Minister. And we're dealing with the mess. Resume your seat. Uh, Senator Birmingham, I've got a senator from your team on his feet, presumably with a point of order, Senator Patterson. You have correctly anticipated, uh, Madam President, on relevance. Uh, the question was about the Assistant Treasurer disregarding the advice of the RBA Governor about inflation expectations, not the other matters Senator Gallagher was going to. Uh, thank you, Senator, senator Patterson. The question was in part about that, but it was also about um, the Reserve Bank increasing interest rates today, skyrocketing inflation and a number of other things. So I do believe that the minister is being relevant. Minister, please continue. Thank you. Um, thank you, President. And, uh, Yes, you're, you're right. In your ruling, the, the preamble was accusatory and ignored the fact that nine years of this mob had left the economy and the budget in a complete shambles, and nobody you, in the Minister, government is disagreeing with the— Senator Tyrrell. Uh, Senator Tyrrell. Oh, apologies. Sorry. We were having a meeting. I apologise, President. Thank you. Um, my question is for the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Minister, let's talk about the Australian Future Leaders Foundation. It's a foundation with no website. It appears to have no office, no staff and no previous record. When the grant was approved, there was no competitive process a merits review wasn't done. Despite all that, the previous government promised the foundation $18 million to set it up and $4 million a year to run it. The Governor-General might think it's a great idea, but with all due respect, Minister, there's no detail, let alone transparency. Where does your government stand on continuing the support for the foundation? 
Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Wong. Uh, and I, can I thank Senator Tyrrell for her question uh, and uh, say I have a, a little bit of knowledge in this, although I suspect um, my colleague, uh, as in most things, Senator Geller has more. Um, uh, I am aware of this because this came to light, uh, as you correctly identify, under the previous government, uh, and it was uh, an issue at estimates that we did ask some questions about. And some of the issues that you avert to were raised by uh, people in the context of preparing for, for that uh, estimates um, round. Uh, I'm advised, or I understand, that that measure, along with a number of other measures that were announced by the previous government, is under review and will be considered in the context of the, of the budget preparation. Thank you, Minister. Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. The Morrison government gave the Australian Future Leaders Foundation deductible gift recipient status last March. Apparently, the amendments were written up and approved a lot faster than normal. Is your government reviewing that decision? Minister. I can seek further advice on that, Senator Tyrrell, but I would anticipate that that would uh, you know, uh, be relevant to the review in the context of the budget, as I've described. Uh, Senator Tyrrell, second supplementary. Minister, media reports suggest the Morrison government's promise to give the foundation funding overlapped with the former Prime Minister's moves to take over more ministries. The Governor-General was involved in both decisions. I'm not suggesting he has done anything wrong, but aren't you worried about the public perception that creates? Minister. I have not, I don't, I, I'm not advised, nor am I aware of how the, those decisions correlate or don't correlate with some of the media reporting of the uh, swearing in of Mr Morrison to a number of other portfolios, which has subsequently come to light. So I'm not in a position to sort of give you an answer on that. Uh, obviously, in relation to uh, the swearing in, the issue of multiple ministries, the um, Prime Minister has commissioned uh, an inquiry. Uh, I think that, there's, that there is a view um, that um, and many Australians have expressed, which I think you're averting to, that would be a good thing if there was more transparency around those, those sorts of arrangements. Uh, but obviously um, uh, the review uh, will deal with that. Uh, and in relation to the uh, DGR status, uh, again, uh, I'll take advice if, uh, and see what I'm able to give you. Uh, but I would assume uh, that may be, that's likely to be relevant to the consideration of the measure through the budget process. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. The Independent Reserve Bank just released its monthly interest rates decision. Can the Minister update the Senate on what that decision was and what it means for Australians, particularly for those with a mortgage? Minister. Um, President, I thank Senator Sheldon for the question. The government understands that Australians are doing it tough and that household budgets are under real pressure. The Independent Reserve Bank has just announced its decision to increase interest rates by another 50 basis points to bring the cash rate to 2.35 per cent. This has been widely predicted, but we know that that doesn't make it any easier for homeowners. We know that this means families will have to make more hard decisions about how to make ends meet. In terms of what it means for an average homeowner owning, owing $330,000, they will have to find it about $95 a month extra for repayments, on top of the $310 extra in repayments since early May. For Australians with a typical $500,000 mortgage, it's about an extra $145 a month, in addition to the extra $475 they've had to find since early May. We know that interest rate rises means families have to make those hard decisions about how to make ends meet. But as the Senate knows, it's not the job of the government to interfere with the independent decisions of the Reserve Bank. The Albanese government's plan is about steering the economy through this difficult period and building that better future that the Australian people uh, deserve. We'll do this, um, President, by investing in the productive capacity of the economy, making those sensible uh, and considered policy decisions and investments uh, that won't add to inflationary pressures. But if we look at areas, and in particular the areas we focused on um, in the Jobs and Skills Summit around access to cheaper uh, and more affordable childcare uh, to cut the price of medicines, to fast track 
those fee-free TAFE places to bring them forward, Senator Hume, to next year, to next year, uh, the increase that we've seen in, in pensions, allowances, and rent assistance, and of course the legislation. Thank you, that Minister. The time has expired. Senator Sheldon, first supplementary. Can the minister explain what the government is doing to assist Australians with current cost of living pressures that have built up over a number of many years? Minister. Thank you, um, President. And since we formed government, we've hit the ground running, yeah, yeah. implementing our policies that were, um, we outlined in the election campaign to respond to the cost of living crisis that we inherited from you lot, those opposite. We can't solve 10 years of neglect and wasted opportunities overnight. We have to start by acknowledging that. But it is our job to do what we responsibly can to help Australians deal with these pressures in the short term and build a more resilient economy that is better able to withstand future shocks. That's why we're making childcare cheaper through our $5 billion investment in the October budget. It's why we're making medicines cheaper. It's why we argued for a minimum wage increase and why we're starting to get the work going on, get mo wages moving again. It's why we're lifting the speed limit on the economy with more investment in TAFE, more investment in cheaper and cleaner energy. Do you like that? Cl cheaper and cleaner Thank energy. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. I'm sorry, Senator. Yes, order. Order. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Second supplementary. Can the minister outline the importance of having a clear plan that will grow the economy and how that will help Australians through these challenging times? Thank you, Minister. Senator Sheldon, for the question. And unlike uh, the previous government, which didn't have an economic plan, it just had a prime minister that wanted to grab up any portfolio he could. That's the only plan that, that you guys had. You didn't know what each other was doing. Our economic plan is a deliberate and direct response to the economic circumstances that uh, were left Minister, by those Minister, opposite. You hate hearing Minister, about it, don't you? Because you know it's your true. Seat. Order. Order. The minister needs to be heard in silence. Thank you. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. We inherited an economy characterised with high and rising inflation, flat and falling real wages and a productivity paralysis. That is your record. We also inherited a budget with a trillion dollars of debt, deficits as far as I can see, billions of dollars chucked in the way of the National Party in a hope that they'd keep your coalition together. That's your record. We're not going to stand here and be lectured by you guys about any cost of living crisis, considering we're the ones dealing with the mess that you left us and you abandoned Australia in the process. Thank you, Minister. You're uh, Senator Davey. Um, thank, you, thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Watt. Minister, uh, as you're very well aware, the Liberals and Nationals in government made a commitment to the residents of Lismore uh, that the entire 150 million allocation from the 22 to 23 Emergency Response Fund would be directed to Lismore for its rebuilding and flood mitigation efforts. Do you intend to stand by this commitment? Minister. Thank you, President. Uh, short answer is yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator, for the question. Um, the, the good thing about answering the question quickly is you can spend the next one minute fifty talking about other things. Um, well, relate, related things, related things. Order. Um, but Senator Order. Davey, I know that you have a genuine interest in um, the people of Lismore and the Northern Rivers. I think you've been there since your appointment as the Shadow Minister, as have I, uh, and, and most recently, Senator Sheldon. The new uh, special envoy for disaster recovery appointed by the, uh, the Prime Minister uh, to ensure that uh, communities who are experiencing disasters uh, recovery are getting the support that they need. In fact, Senator Sheldon was in Lismore just last week, on Friday I believe it was, announcing additional support for the Northern Rivers in the form of around $50 million to support commercial landlords uh, uh, with grants the importance of that, as Senator Sheldon so eloquently put in the press conference that he, he undertook in Lismore, uh, is that there are many small businesses who are located in 
commercial premises who, and those small businesses are not able to reopen yet because the commercial landlords have not been able to afford to repair their properties. So that assistance, which is contributed to by the New South Wales government, will assist with not just the landlords but the small businesses as well. So again, can I thank Senator Sheldon for the work that he's been doing there. But um, the money that Senator Davey is talking about, of course, comes from the infamous Emergency Response Fund. Remember that one? Yeah. The Emergency Response Fund that the government set up over three years ago with $4 billion in it. Uh, that accrued the, the former government over $800 million in interest, did not build a single disaster mitigation project, did not spend a cent on disaster recovery. It took the devastating floods we saw in the Northern Rivers in Queensland for any announcements to be made. And which government is going to deliver on them? The Albanese Labor government. Uh, Senator Davey, first supplementary. Yes, well, thank you, Minister. Um, the, uh, and I'm, I'm, I always appreciate a, a quick answer, and I appreciate you being so succinct. So yes, Liz Moore, you get $150 million in this financial year. So the Prime Minister recently announced $75 million of funding from the Emergency Response Fund to be spread across 62 local government areas in New South Wales. Can you confirm that this money is from the 2021 to 22 pool? Uh, Minister. Thank you, uh, short answer? Yes, I can. Um, the, so just to, just to assist Senator Davey, the previous question was about the allocation of $150 million from the unused emergency response fund for 22-23, and that money will be used for the Northern Rivers, not just Lismore, but for the Northern Rivers. Uh, the money that you're talking about there, uh, the $75 million, came from the 2021-22 allocation from the Emergency Response Fund. And as Senator Mackenzie would know, because I think she was involved in making the announcement as the then minister, um, the remaining $75 million from the 21-22 allocation uh, will be spent in Queensland, assisting them recover from their floods. So it's $150 million for each of those two financial years. The first of those two years is being split between Queensland and New South Wales, and that will be spent in New South Wales across the whole state because, of course, there were other areas that experienced floods too. Thank you, Minister. Senator Davey, second supplementary. So thank you very much. As I now understand it, you have just confirmed that the amount announcement made by the Prime Minister um, at the Bush summit claiming $75 million was new money for the people of Lismore was in fact the same money as announced by the Liberals and Nationals in government in March this year, re-announced by yourself in June this year and now announced for a third time by the Prime Minister. What message have you got to the people of Lismore? Uh, Senator who can Davey, your time has expired. Minister. The Order. message. Thank you. Order. Thank you, President. Thank you, President. Minister, the, please resume your seat. Oh, let's just give the minister a chance to answer before we start the disorderly interjections, Minister. The message, Senator Davey, that I have for the people of Lismore is that they finally have a federal government who will actually deliver to them. They will have it. They have a government that shows up. Unlike the former government, certain people from our opposition, as it was at the time, were in Lismore shortly after the floods, uh, and we will deliver. Now, the, I, I, I do need to just correct one thing I said before. The, the funding that Senator Sheldon announced was $30 million Order. for commercial landlords as opposed to 50. so just to correct the record there. Uh, there's so much support that we're putting in, and it's sometimes hard to remember exactly how much there's so much money being put in, which, which is very much deserved. The, the announcement the Prime Minister made in Griffith the other day uh, was to announce how the money would be spent. So we have worked with the New South Wales government collaboratively, something that the previous Liberal and National federal government was unable to do with a Liberal and National government, and we're now Thank getting you, on with Minister delivering White, the money. Your time has expired. Senator White. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Watt. What are the latest figures from ABES on the value of uh, Australia's agricultural production and exports? Minister. Thank you, Senator White. And I'm really looking forward to seeing your sterling performances on the uh, Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee, which I know you will do so well. Uh, and Senator White, I can confirm that I have good news for farmers and good news for Australians. 
today the Australian Bureau of Agricultural and Resource Economics and Sciences, otherwise known as ABES, has released their latest report on Australian crops and commodities. This year, farm exports are forecast to be worth a record-breaking $70.3 billion, which is a remarkable achievement. This is the biggest ever agricultural exports in our nation's history. I am shocked, I am shocked, President, that the National Party of all parties Order. wants to yell Order. at us when we have good news for farmers and good news for agriculture. But then again, Minister when you see Watt, what the leader of the National Party— Please resume your seat. Order on my left in particular. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. It's a shame that they hate good news, President, even when it comes to farmers and agriculture. But then again, it's no surprise when we see what the leader of the National Party has to say Order. about the National Farmers' Federation, calling them cowards uh, and all sorts of other things as well. This is the biggest ever agricultural exports our nation has ever seen. And ABES has also forecast a winter crop harvest of 55.5 million tonnes. This combination of high yields and high exports is good news for Aussie farmers, farm workers, rural communities and Order. all of us in this country. And it also means that Australia can do its part in contributing to global food supply. Over this side of the chamber, we like good news, especially when it comes to agriculture and our farmers. It's unfortunate that we're not joined on the other side. We know that trade and exports make all the difference in times of stress and food scarcity, and I couldn't be prouder to see Australia more than pulling its weight. And I congratulate all the farmers and all the farm workers who've worked so hard to deliver these fantastic results. It's happening in all sorts of sectors. Uh, we know Thank the you, industry Minister. has its challenges. Uh, Senator White, first supplementary. What fantastic news, Senator Watt. What is the uh, Albanese government uh, doing to support the agriculture industry reach its goal of $100 billion by 2030? Minister. Thank you, President. Thanks again, Senator White. As I was just saying in answer to the last question, we know that the agriculture sector has its challenges and we're getting on with solving them. But in the meantime, uh, this data shows that the industry is in good shape, and that's a good thing. In terms of the, the supplementary question, we are in lockstep with the agriculture sector's ambition to become a $100 billion industry by 2030. And we're not doing that. Uh, we are doing this uh, by working with all players in the industry, not dividing them and not fighting against them. We are bringing people together, not hurling insults from the sidelines when it comes to agriculture. And that started with the industry roundtables I held in my first weeks as minister, and it's continued at the Jobs and Skills Summit, where we agreed on measures to help the industry deal with workforce shortages right now. It re I am stunned. At first it was the National Party getting stuck in about agriculture doing well. Now it's the Liberal Party getting stuck in about agriculture doing well. What's, I thought you liked agriculture. I thought you liked rural communities. This is good news for the industry. And Thank all you, you can Minister. Do is yell. Your time has expired. Senator White, second. Uh, Senator Senator White, second supplementary. What are the main threats to agricultural productivity? Senator McKenzie. And what is the Albanese government doing to support industry in addressing these challenges? Minister. Thank you, Senator White. Now, when I, when I was suggested that I could ask a question about the threats to agriculture productivity, I took the high road and I decided to not comment on the threats that sit over the opposition. But now that with all this feedback that I'm getting, maybe I'll have to drop the script and revise the answer. Uh, it will come as no surprise uh, that one of the major threats to the industry is this is serious. It will come as no surprise there is one of the major threats to the industry is the risk of exotic animal diseases entering the country from overseas. We've implemented a three-pronged approach to help protect industry by supporting Indonesia to deal with their outbreak, strengthening our borders and by ensuring we are prepared should an outbreak occur. And it's really good to see cattle prices uh, at sales across the country beginning to rebound in spite of the fear-mongering that we saw from those opposite over the last couple of months. Another serious threat is the impacts that climate change is having on farming, as natural disasters become more fierce and more frequent. And supporting the sector to adapt and improve its climate resilience is imperative to our future food and fibre security. Thank you, security. Minister. The time has expired. Um, Senator Canavan jumped. I, I, I think I have to go to Senator Wong first. Uh, Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, um, Order. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy. Oh, sorry, sorry, ma ma um, Madam President. Um, I did. Sorry. 
Okay. Please uh, continue. Senator Watts Senator doing such Canavan. a good job that my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, uh, Fisheries and Forestry again. On the 9th of August, Labor, and the Labor government announced a $10 million biosecurity cooperation package to assist Indonesia as it responds to foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease. Can the Minister for Agriculture outline how many staff have been trained on the ground in Indonesia? Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Canada, Senator Canavan, for giving me an opportunity to talk again about the support that our government is providing uh, Indonesia to deal with its foot and mouth disease outbreak and its lumpy skin disease outbreak. The, uh, I was very pleased uh, to make the announcement that Senator Canavan refers to, in partnership with Senator Wong, uh, that we would provide $10 million in international development support to Indonesia to assist them with their outbreak. That, of course, comes in addition to the support that we had already offered. Uh, shortly after I was appointed to the role as minister, I uh, committed one million vaccines for foot and mouth disease to Indonesia, which I'm very pleased to say have arrived in Indonesia, have been delivered and are in the process of being uh, uh, provided to farmers as we speak. Uh, we then went on to announce, uh, I'm pretty sure the figure was $14 million uh, on my return from Indonesia in additional support uh, in the form of more vaccines, more technical assistance, uh, diagnostics um, and other Minister, things. Please resume your seat. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, um, Madam President. Uh, just a point of order on relevance. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the question was very specific about how many staff uh, had been trained on the ground, and the, and the minister has mentioned a lot about the package but hasn't gone anywhere near uh, answering the question. I'll listen closely to the remainder of the question. Um, it, my understanding was it's also a, it's primarily about foot and mouth disease, but please, Minister, continue. <laughs> Uh, thank you, President. The, the $10 million package that I announced at the Press Club, and again I recognise Senator Wong for her contribution to that announcement, uh, was a combination of issues. Some of it was staff, and I'm happy to take on notice for you the exact number of staff that are, that are working there. It includes uh, vets and other uh, technical assistance as well. But that money also involves another allocation of vaccines to Indonesia, which we are in the process of procuring. I know there are some people over the other side who think that you should be able to snap your fingers and get those vaccines immediately. That's not how it works. There's a worldwide shortage of those vaccines at the moment, but we are actively engaged in procurement negotiations to obtain another round of vaccines which will be delivered. Uh, but as I say, that $10 million goes further than just vaccines. It's things like providing vets, uh, providing diagnostic assistance to make sure that Indonesia has the capability to undertake testing uh, for foot and mouth disease and a range of other support as well. Thank you, Senator Canavan. First supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, uh, and that goes to my supplementary question on vaccines. The minister has already outlined that the package includes uh, vaccines. But can the minister outline if any vaccines that we have purchased have been administered in Indonesia to date? Thank you, uh, Senator Canavan. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. And thank you, Senator Canavan. Just before answering the supplementary question, uh, I should also point out that the support that we're providing to Indonesia in the sense of personnel is also provided remotely. Um, so there will be and, uh, and will be additional Australian staff on the ground in Indonesia, but some of that support is already being provided remotely back here from Australia as well. Um, as I say, one million vaccines uh, that Australia is providing to Indonesia have now arrived. Uh, that happened a couple of weeks ago. Again, I'm happy to give you the exact details on notice as to how many of, of those vaccines have been administered. But my understanding is that the rollout has, is well progressed. Uh, we know that there's an urgent need to get those vaccines into uh, cattle as quickly as possible. And I'm happy to come back on notice with the uh, exact answer. Senator Canavan, second supplementary. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, uh, the package also includes technical and advisory support to tackle outbreaks in Indonesia. Can the minister outline exactly what support is being provided to date? Minister. Um, again, thank you, President. Again, I'm, I'm happy to provide on notice uh, the exact details of the support that's been provided to date from that package in the form of technical assistance. Uh, I, I think I've pretty much already answered what that technical assistance will involve. It's a mixture of veterinary assistance, um, diagnostics assistance to help with testing capability, uh, the manufacturing of vaccines, because of course Indonesia have said that they want to manufacture their, their vaccines domestically. But again, I'll come back with the exact details on notice. Uh, Minister Senator Wong. I'm so tempted to keep going, Madam President, but uh, may I ask that further questions be placed on notice? I have a lot of people on that side.
Senator Chandler. The Senate take note of the uh, answer provided by Senator Gallagher to the question asked by Senator Patterson during question time. Thank you, Mr yeah, Deputy call. President. Um, well, it's quite appropriate, I think, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, that that last hour or so of our parliamentary day is referred to as question time and not answer time, because certainly if any good Australians were listening in to what the Senate was discussing over this past period, they wouldn't have any clearer answer as to what this government, the Labor Albanese government, is doing to address uh, the rising inflation and cost of living pressures in this country. We know that Australian households are feeling the pinch when it comes to the spiralling cost of living expenses and record high inflation. And I note, uh, Mr Deputy President, that inflation under the Albanese government is running at 6.1 per cent as of uh, the June 2022 quarter. This is the highest rate of inflation in almost uh, 32 years since the December quarter in 1990. Uh, I was about six months old when inflation was last that high, Mr, Acting, uh, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, and I certainly uh, expect that many people um, of my age and in my generation will uh, not have really understood or, or uh, experienced the pressures uh, resulting out of inflation this high in their lifetime. Over the last few months, we've also seen the price of household goods skyrocket, uh, increased cost of services and rising building costs. Australians feel these inflationary pressures every time they pass through the supermarket checkout, when they head to their local medical practitioner or when they want to treat their family to a day out to mark a special occasion. And in my own state of Tasmania, where we rely on air and sea freight services to transport essential household goods such as groceries, these rising transport costs are only adding to the inflationary pain. All of these expenses add up and they make it harder and harder for Australian households to make ends meet. Yet this government has failed to deliver any shred of a plan to immediately address the rising cost of living and the pressure of inflation on Australian households. They did have one idea during the election campaign. We heard time and time again the Labor Party telling everybody that they would cut their power bills by $275 a year for the average Australian household. Reducing the amount that Australians pay for their power would at least have provided some relief to household budgets, but they've abandoned that commitment, Mr Deputy President. They have gone back on their promise, hoping that Australians wouldn't notice. Well, certainly our job in opposition, Mr Deputy President, is to make sure that Australians notice that the Labor government has gone back on that commitment that that made during the election. In abandoning that commitment, Labor have shown Australians that they have no real plan to tackle cost of living expenses and inflationary pressures. And while talk might be cheap for Labor, it doesn't result in cheaper power bills for Australians. And what have Labor been doing instead of developing this plan to tackle the rising cost of inflation, the rising uh, inflation and the rising cost of living? Photo opportunities with American basketballers and moving to abolish the ABCC to appease their union mates. The Prime Minister was asked by reporters only this morning what he would do to address the cost of living, and he responded with some sort of uh, vague uh, response about introducing legislation uh, aimed at medicine prices and childcare at some point in the future. I don't think that response is going to in any way address the immediate pressure of cost of living and inflation that is being felt by Australians, Mr Deputy President. Australians expect an answer to this problem now, today. They don't expect one into the future. They don't expect, oh, we'll look at this problem down the track or we'll think about it in the October budget. These are pressures that Australians are feeling here and now on this very day. It certainly seems like the government is just making it up as it goes along. And adding further pain to Australians today are paying off their home. Interest rates have continued to rise, uh, with the additional financial burden being felt by those making mortgage repayments. Uh, as the Minister, uh, Senator Gallagher, updated the chamber partway through question time, the cash rate today has increased by 50 basis points to 2.35 per cent, which signifies five consecutive months of rate rises, with borrowers starting to feel the pressure as they pay off their mortgage. Part of the great Australian dream has always been home ownership, and these rising interest rates are only going to add to the financial impediments on those Australians looking to own a home of their own, looking to make ends meet at a time where costs of living and inflation are only getting higher. 
As Australia grappled with the detrimental effects of the pandemic, however, the previous coalition government was absolutely aware that we needed a solid and multi-pronged approach to assist with Australia's economic recovery. That's what we did in, our gov in government. That is our record, and it's disappointing to see this sort of response from the Senator Labor Chair. government. Senator Brown. Uh, Deputy President, I, I really think that the, the contribution by Senator Chandler has completely ignored the last nine years of her government. On the 21st of May, on the 21st of May, the House of Cards that was your government came tumbling down, exposed for what it was—a government of waste, rorts and lost opportunities. And quite, quite frankly, that's been kind. That's been kind to their government. That's been kind to nine years of a Liberal coalition government. Because we had sport, don't forget we had sports rorts. We had cuts to aged care spending, and we, of course, we had cuts to real wages. Boasted about, boasted about, by the um, government of the day. Boasted about the fact that it was a deliberate design in their economic plan. They didn't have a plan. They didn't have a plan. What they had was. Uh, a, a, a prime minister that was focused on delivering for their mates, focused on rorting public monies to go into areas where they thought it would be best for a political return, not an economic plan to put um, this country on the right path. Now, this government, the Albanese government, understands the, that um, people are doing it tough. And we have, uh, and they also understand that we have inherited, as Senator Gallagher said in her uh, response to the question today, that we've inherited from the Liberal opposition a cost of living crisis. You can't ignore that that is the fact. So no matter what Senator Chandler wants to talk about in terms of um, the plan that her, her government had, everyone knows, the Australian people know. That's why they punted them on the 21st of May. That's why they're on that side, because the Australian people got sick of their money being wasted with no plan, just wait waste, rorts and lost opportunities. So yes, we have inherited a cost of living crisis from those opposite, an economic and budget in complete shambles. That's what we inherited. But the Albanese government does understand that Australians are doing it tough, tough. and the current cost of living pressures that have been built up over many years. But we have acted quickly, and Senator Gallagher, in a, her response, did um, mention some of those, um, some of the initiatives that the um, Labor government is putting in place. To, so we do say, and we're very upfront about this, we, we can't solve the nine years of neglect and decay overnight. But it's, it's our task to do what we can do responsibly to help Australians deal with these pressures in the short term and build a more resilient economy that is better able to withstand future shocks. That's why we are making childcare cheaper through our $5 billion investment in the October budget. And that's why we're making medicines cheaper. And that's why we successfully, successfully argued for a minimum wage increase and, we're, and why we're starting to work to get wages moving again. Unlike, unlike the uh, now opposition that boasts about keeping wages low, I mean, the very issue that goes to the heart of the family household budget. And then they come in here and try to say that it's all our fault. 
trillion dollars of debt, a shambles of an economy and a budget, a, a cost of living crisis that we inherited from them. The goal. So we have argued successfully, as I've said, uh, and, our, and our job is to start to get wages moving again. Senator Canavan. Deputy President, uh, it is very uh, notable that uh, in Senator Brown's contribution uh, on this debate that uh, she almost exclusively spoke about the past, almost exclusively uh, spoke about, in her words, the last nine years, uh, all looking back in the rearview mirror, uh, almost nothing uh, in her contribution seeking to defend this new government about the future. And it is the future that is concerning uh, Australians right now, because Australians can see uh, this cost of living crisis coming down the tracks to them. It is already uh, quite difficult for many Australian families as interest rates have gone up significantly over the past six months. Five rate rises uh, in a row, uh, the, the, the fastest uh, uh, increase in interest rates since the mid-1990s. Very, very difficult for Australian families. Petrol prices have obviously gone up significantly over the past year uh, due to the European energy crisis and then the invasion, a barbaric invasion of Ukraine uh, by the Russian president. That's already hurting Australians. But unfortunately, unfortunately, we can all see and know that perhaps, perhaps the worst is yet to come. Later this month, uh, uh, petrol prices are set, are set to rise by 22 cents a litre when the former government's excise relief comes off. And that's something I think that we have to do. We cannot uh, afford to neglect our roads, and uh, fuel excisers do pay for that. Uh, so that will be an increased cost for Australian families. The RBA governor today, in raising rates, has indicated that uh, more rate rises uh, are probably set to come over the next year, that it is probably not the end of this tightening cycle. So while many Australians are already facing increased mortgage payments of $1,000 a month, uh, that will even be higher potentially over the next year. And finally, finally, uh, electricity bills are about to skyrocket. Uh, we have not got enough reliable energy uh, in our market. And, and uh, the increase in wholesale power costs we've seen this year have gone up four or five times have not yet flown through to retail bills that will happen later this year. So in that context, you'd think you'd have this government focused almost exclusively on this living cost crisis, but instead they're distracted. They're distracted. I kind of miss, I kind of miss Mr. Bill Shorten. You remember uh, Mr. Shorten used to talk about the top end of town? Well, this government is one that's constantly hobnobbing with the top end of town. Last week, last week Jobs and Skills Summit here that we had here, almost everybody here was either from big business or big unions and certainly themselves had no issue with paying their mortgages no issue with paying even skyrocketing energy bills later this year, and there was almost zero talk from the participants at that conference about the major issue that Australians are concerned about today. Uh, because the government cannot talk about its cost of living plan, because it's already dumped that plan it took to the Australian people less than six months ago. Less than six months ago, uh, Mr Anthony Albanese promised the Australian people multiple times that he would slash their electricity bills by $275. He said it time and time again that your bills would be $275 a year lower under a Labor government. And in a matter of weeks, he walked away from that promise. He has not mentioned, the new Prime Minister has not mentioned that figure again uh, since the election. And, and it is a, so world, must be a world record uh, for a government breaking such a key promise so quickly uh, to the Australian people. Uh, the government now talks about doesn't talk about its power bill plan. If, if you're looking for relief on electricity bills, don't ask this new government. They have no plan. Uh, but now they do rest back on, and Senator Brown, in the brief moment she spoke about the government's plan, uh, rest back on their childcare plan. They rest back on their childcare plan, and Senator Brown mentioned five billion dollars. Very little. Do you, do, do, do she doesn't say. And very often they never say, the Labor government never says and reveals that that $5 billion is predominantly going to very rich people in this country. Indeed, under the government's childcare plans, they are going to raise childcare subsidies for families earning up to $530,000 a year. $530,000 a year. You'll get, if you're earning $500,000, half a million dollars a year, you're very, very lucky. You're going to even be luckier thanks to a Labor government because you're going to get more money from them. From them. The Department of Education modelled this, and they showed that a family on 360 grand a year will be $11,000 a year better off. $11,000 a year. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Albanese. If you're on $360,000 a year, if you're on $70,000 a year, you're only $1,700 a year better off. The 85% lower benefit for those families. 
That is the priorities of this new government. The Labor Party are no longer the party of the working class. They are no longer the party that look after the downtrodden in this society. They are wholly and exclusively focused on the Business Council of Australia, on the large unions that get big kickbacks from big super. They are focused on those interests and those interests alone. They do not listen to and do not represent those Australians who struggle in this country and are struggling more because of this ignored cost of living crisis from this government. Senator Cox. Sorry, Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Senator Cox, um, are you seeking to take note of, of, of a Answers. answer to a Greens question? Yes. Yeah, no, we'll get to you uh, in a moment. We have, oh, we have a, an order of service as it speaks. Uh, uh, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And I, uh, I thank Senator Patterson for his questions on uh, inflation and on interest rates uh, in this country. And I, I thank Senator Gallagher for her answers uh, as well. Uh, and of course, uh, on these questions, um, it must be uh, noted from the outset that the Albanese government has inherited uh, an economy from those opposite uh, with high and rising inflation. Uh, we have inherited an economy uh, with rising interest rates as well. Uh, and uh, on top of that, we have inherited an economy with the slowest wages growth on record. Uh, so in short, uh, the Albanese government has come into office uh, inheriting a full-blown cost of living crisis from those opposite. Uh, and one of the most important things that we need to do in the context of that crisis uh, to help Australians get through it, to help Australians do well, uh, to help Australians survive and thrive in this environment, uh, is that we need to get wages moving in this country. Uh, and we also need to deal directly with the rising cost of living. Uh, and we are already putting plans in place to do both. We need to get wages moving so that people have the resources that they need to deal with the rising cost of living. Uh, and we have hit the ground running to do just that. Uh, right on uh, winning government, uh, we made a submission to the Fair Work Commission um, arguing for an increase in the minimum wage. Uh, and our submissions, along with the work of the Australian trade union movement, um, were successful and there was, in fact, a 5.2 per cent increase to the minimum wage. Um, we have also made submissions to the aged care work value case, um, supporting a pay rise for some of Australia's lowest paid workers, indeed hundreds of thousands of workers, because we are committed to the women who work in the care economy and we are committed to getting wages moving in this country. Um, just last week, we brought together 150 people from around the country uh, in our absolutely historic Jobs and Skills Summit um, to really answer the fundamental questions about the economy. How do we get wages moving? How do we improve productivity? How do we get the country moving in one direction together? Uh, and there were a number of things that were agreed about getting wages uh, moving, uh, agreed by really everyone uh, at the summit, um, except, of course, for those opposite. Uh, really, everyone agrees in our country that we need to get wages moving. Uh, except the opposition. Everyone agrees that the bargaining system is broken, uh, except apparently the opposition. Everyone agrees we should bring people together. We should bring unions and employers together to focus on solutions. Uh, everyone apparently except uh, the opposition and the opposition leader who refused to turn up. Um, everyone agrees that women working in the care economy are the most in need of reform to our industrial relations system, um, apparently everyone except uh, the opposition. Uh, so we are focused on bringing people together. We are focused on the cost of living crisis. Uh, we are focused on getting wages moving to help people deal with that crisis, um, because that is, of course, half the equation of dealing with the crisis delivered by the former government. 
getting wages moving. And that is exactly what we have hit the ground running doing, and that is exactly what we will continue to do. The second half of the equation is direct action, of course, to relieve the rising costs of living. Uh, and we have just, of course, announced the biggest indexation of social security payments on record. Uh, and that is going to help uh, so many Australians deliver uh, deal with the rising cost of living that has been delivered by the previous government. Uh, we have also uh, extended the paid pandemic leave uh, that was due to expire under those opposite. We've introduced legislation to drive investment in cleaner and cheaper energy to put downward pressure on power prices. Uh, we, as Senator Canavan noticed, are going to make childcare cheaper. So we are dealing with the cost of living crisis bequeathed by the previous government. Senator Scar. At the outset, uh, in terms of speaking to my colleague Senator Patterson's question to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher, I want to address a, a claim that was made by Senator Gallagher that potentially the Assistant Treasurer had been verbaled. And I've had the opportunity during question time by referring to my mobile phone to see that the Assistant Treasurer, in fact, on his own website, stephenjones.org.au, if people want to refer to it, said this, and I quote, because we actually, this might sound bizarre to many of your listeners, and I should say it sounds bizarre to me as a senator in this place, but if we have demand galloping ahead and galloping ahead and people just putting up prices for a limited supply of goods and services, then that is going to feed into hyperinflation, end quote. Hyperinflation. End quote. That's from Stephen Jones's own website, and we were accused, or my colleague Senator Patterson was accused, of not quoting the Assistant Treasurer appropriately in terms of the context of this question. This is important. This is important. Language is, conf is, is important because it feeds into the confidence or lack thereof in the market. And using the term hyperinflation was extraordinarily irresponsible extraordinarily irresponsible by the Assistant Treasurer. Because when people think of hyperinflation, they think of Germany, where in July 1920, one mark equated to 40 US dollars, and then by November 1923, one mark equated to four, four, I should say one US dollar equated to four trillion marks. That's hyperinflation. That's hyperinflation. And it is grossly irresponsible grossly irresponsible for the Treasurer to, Assistant Treasurer to use that term hyperinflation in the current market. We are nowhere near hyperinflation, and I don't expect we'll come anywhere near hyperinflation. The RBA certainly doesn't think so. Treasury doesn't think so. So why do we have an Assistant Treasurer who doesn't know such a fundamental term of economics in terms of hyperinflation? The textbook, the textbook definition of hyperinflation is at least inflation of 50 per cent per month. Per month. We're nowhere near that, but we have an assistant treasurer who doesn't know the actual definition of hyperinflation. Maybe they should keep him away from radio interviews so he doesn't scare the horses of the Australian economy so much. We also have a government, we also have a government that doesn't want to live up to the $275 power cut process. It will cut. This is from the Labor Party's own policy. The Labor Party's own policy, up currently on their on their website, on their website called Powering Australia. It's still there, and this is what it says. I quote: "It will cut power bills for families and businesses by $275 a year for homes by 2025, compared to today." End quote. That's what it says. The policy. It's still on the Labor Party's website. And as my colleagues in this place have referred to consistently, it has been referred to over 90 times during the course of the election campaign, that $275 cut in Australians' power prices. But when the Albanese government is formed, there's no mention of this promise, this promise to the Australian people, absolutely no mention of it. There was ample opportunity during question time for it to be referred to. But this promise that was given during the election campaign by the Australian Labor Party on their own website. You can check it out yourselves. $275 a year cut. No mention of it. Absolutely no mention of it by the Albanese government. Albanese opposition, $275 price cut. 
Albanese government, no mention. No mention. Still on its website, if you want to verify it. Still on its website. And then we have the introduction of the Climate Change Bill 2022, an urgent bill introduced earlier today, an urgent bill, even though by the admission of their own minister it's not necessary. I, I don't, how can something be urgent if it's not necessary? It baffles me. But the Climate Change Bill 2022, it doesn't make any mention of the $275 price cut. No mention of the $275 price cut. So we introduce the Climate Change Bill, though it's not necessary, their own minister said. It then becomes urgent. And when they introduce it, one would have thought that electricity prices are connected to climate change. But no, there's no mention of the promise of $275 price cut made by the Labor government when they are in opposition. Thanks, Senator Scar. I put the question to the motion moved by Senator Chandler. Those for the question say aye, against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, it's disappointing to see uh, the government— you, uh, uh, Senator having, Cox, you just moved. Did you wish to take note of the answer? Take note of the answer uh, given by Minister Farrell Please to go on. my question during question Thank time. Um, and it's disappointing uh, but not surprising to see the government patting themselves on the back for doing less than the bare minimum. Um, in fact, we got no answer to the actual question during question time. And in this instance, I agree with Senator Chandler, it should be called answer time instead of question time, because um, it's all smoke and mirrors, and that's what we're getting at the moment. Um, legislating 43 per cent is not enough, and opening up an expansion of new fossil fuel projects are inconsistent not only with the government's own target but also its commitments under the Paris Agreement, and this is what we heard. Science is pretty clear. Safe climate means no more fossil fuels, and they must go. So formally legislating a target should actually be 75 per cent by 2030. We need to start phasing out fossil fuels. And this includes methane. And methane, the global methane pledge was at the heart of the supplementary question that I asked. And we need to start doing that not tomorrow, not in the future, not in six months. We need to start doing that today. A climate bill was introduced earlier today. Therefore, we need that commitment. Over 100 countries signed up to that global methane pledge at COP26. Uh, everyone except Australia. That's because Australia skipped along to COP26 in Scotland, hand in hand with Santos, and, and talked about carbon capture and storage, which is completely unproven to work. So addressing methane emissions is paramount to us actually reducing our emissions, and we need a robust plan. We cannot afford to have a minister sitting across in the other house doing policy on the run in this place. So we needed sufficient investment to make sure that this occurs. And we can't go dumping carbon, and I'm calling it colonial carbon capitalism that we're giving and dumping it in the Timor Sea for the Timorese people to deal with after we've gone on a botched plan to think carbon capture and storage is about offsets in this country. We need to make sure that we are actually um, making this government are accountable for being good on climate, because they're actually not. You can't have fossil fuel donors and play both sides of the fence and then be good for the climate by expanding their projects. We actually need a robust plan to look at how we invest in the economy. The UK have done it. They've reduced their emissions by 40 per cent since 1990, and they've tripled their economy in size. Here, here. Senator Thorpe. I'd like to respond to Minister Farrell uh, when he talks, uh, when he spoke about what they're doing around First Nations. We know that this government uh, all talk and no action when it comes to First Nations justice in this country. It's okay to, to walk around saying Black Lives Matter, but if you are not seeking free, prior, and informed consent from those traditional owners whose country is about to be destroyed by Santos then please do not say Black Lives Matter. Please do not even fly our flag when you are destroying land, culture, song, dance and ignoring traditional owners when you want to talk about a voice in this country. You don't even listen to traditional owners right now. What are you waiting for? A referendum to give you what? A group of people who you're then going to deny again? We are sick of the rhetoric of this Labor government. It's been going on too long. 
We hear from a judge who is hearing from the Tiwi Island people who says that their rights need to be listened to. Now, I am pleading with this government to also listen to the rights of those traditional owners instead of some of the do dodgy corporations and organisations that you go to to manufacture consent. That's what Labor does. They manufacture consent. They pick a few of their buddies to sign off on dirty deals that destroy country. They are dirty deals supported by industries that donate money to you to ensure that you give them the favours that they want and need. And that does not uh, give any rights to Indigenous people or First Nations people in this country. You won't even agree to fast-tracking the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. You won't even have a reporting date on that because you're scared of the rights that it will give us to stop you destroying us and our people. We are a wake-up to this government. No, you're not our friends because you continue to destroy country and ignore the real people that want to have a say. I'm going to put the question as moved by Senator Cox. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it.